All right. Is um, is anybody listening? Good. So I will um, start my um, presentation. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, it's uh, very exciting to uh, be part of this 24-hour um, webinar. Um, my uh, pitch today is about um, regenerative design. Um, I want to... Just, yeah, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, what company I come from, the company Rumble. Um, I want to say a few words about uh, what is the problem we are trying to solve. Then I want to explain what is regenerative design and why is this important. And I want to show a couple of projects that could be considered as regenerative projects. And, um, and that's probably you know, where I will end the presentation. So Ramble is uh, an um, engineering company that was founded 77 years ago, so right after the Second World War, in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, we have since grown, and today we are about 16,000 people. Uh, a lot of us are engineers, but we actually have um, all kinds of experts, uh, including uh, economists, uh, we have architecture, we have um, all kinds of um, nature uh, and biological, ecological um, experts. We are covering uh, 35 country, countries, maybe in the West, mainly in the Western world. Um, and our revenue is uh, just short of uh, 2 billion euros. Um, we do not have any external shareholders. We are owned by a foundation and uh, the staff of Ramble is controlling the um, foundation. So we are a self-owned entity. Um, and this is uh, the distribution of our about 300 offices in total. As you can see, we are pretty heavy represented in Europe and North America, but we also have uh, lots of small offices uh, in across Asia, Australia, a little bit in uh, Africa and South America. So <clears throat> what is the problem we're trying to solve? <clears throat> well, um, if you look at the construction sector um, the, uh, and the, the global uh, buildings stock, we have about uh, 235 billion square meters of um, buildings today. So that is what has been built since the beginning of time until now that still stands. Uh, we also know that we're gonna build another 230 billion square meters in the next 40 years. So by 2060, we will need about 465 billion square meters of buildings. So that's a huge uh, challenge for the construction sector. And it um, it's, has an enormous environmental impact unless we find a different way to build all these buildings. So basically we are about to build 6 billion square meters of buildings every year. That is more than the entire UK building stock, just so you can compare. And why are we needing so some, some many buildings? Well, first of all, uh, we do see a, a growth in wealth across um, the world. We see less people uh, living in poverty. So in general, uh, today, people have about 30 square meters of building per person in average across the world but that will increase to about 45 square meters per person. It's still far from what we see in the Western world. In most Western countries, we have about 100 square meters of building stock per person. 
Um, and the other factor that comes into play here is that the uh, global population will increase from about 7.8 billion today to about 10 billion in 2060. So those two factors are causing uh, a doubling of uh, the needed building stock. Um, we also know that embodied carbon constitutes about 11% of global emissions today. Uh, that can be translated into about three gigatons of um, carbon emissions every year. And um, so that's the, the biggest challenge um, that we face. How can we build without uh, all these uh, embodied carbon emissions? Um, so what is the problem? Well, we have, there's a concept called, um, you no know, planetary boundaries. This is about what is the bio capacity of the planet uh, to support um, life. And we damage, we're damaging um, the planet every day, but it has the capacity to recover from that damage but there is a limit to how much the planet can recover. Uh, and so there is also a limit to how much damage we can uh, impose on the planet for that reason. Otherwise we will keep, um, you know, we'll damage it too, too far for it to be able to recover. And uh, as you can see from this diagram, uh, which has been um, developed about 10 years ago or so, the, um, there are a number of, of uh, items or topics that uh, are critical for the survival of the planet. And uh, at least three or four of these uh, items, we have already exceeded the capacity of the planet. So that is climate change where we are in the yellow. It is the biodiversity where we are in the red. It's land systems change. Um, where we're in yellow, and then it's about bio geochemical flows, which is not so much related to buildings, but more to uh, to farming and food production. So you could say uh, from this diagram, if we continue the way we are today, we will just be in the red on all parameters um, in a couple of decades. And so we are, we are slowly, or maybe even very fast, um, ruining our, um, planet and therefore also the um, the home that we all have uh, where we need to to uh, live so um, with nine, 9.7 billion people in 2050 and uh, 10.2 billion in 2060 we will need the biocapacity of three planets so this was a statement from the UN uh, in 2019 and if I translate this so you all understand it. It's uh, it's about you know we are we are it's like borrowing money in the bank, and um, and we we need to pay back <laughs> this money at some point. Otherwise, the, we will go bankrupt. We cannot keep borrowing uh, money or borrowing um, the resources of of the planet. So how do we get from red to yellow to green again? Um, well, we do that uh, through regenerative design. And I just wanna say uh, that uh, in giving this quote, in, way, in many ways, the environmental crisis that we see today is a design crisis. It's about, you know, it's caused by the way we design uh, buildings. It is a consequence of how things are made, how buildings are constructed and how landscapes are used. So that's, I mean, we can do things, we can design things differently. We don't have to design it in the way we're doing today. So that's what I'm gonna explain now. Um, and in order to explain it, I, I have brought back this diagram, which is also um, not new. It's um, developed by Bill Reed, uh, maybe 15 years ago. And it shows the sustainability scale. So from the very, far left, we have the unsustainable conventional buildings. Uh, we move to the right, go through more green buildings, 
we call it sustainable when it has zero impact. Uh, sustainable means you can continue doing what you're doing forever uh, for the next generations and so on. So basically, if you, if you have zero impact, then you also have a sustainable building. You don't have a sustainable building unless you have zero impact. But sustainability or sustainable is not enough if we want to go from red to yellow to green on the planetary boundaries. We must help the planet restore itself. We must do restorative buildings or we must do even better regenerative buildings. So the, um, the ambition would be to go uh, over the coming years from the left to the right. Business as usual is, as we all know, to the left. You all know the different certification schemes like LEED. Uh, LEED Silver will probably take uh, buildings a little further to the right. LEED Gold will take it a little further and LEED Platinum will take it maybe uh, not all the way, but um, almost all the way of the way to being sustainable. Um, but basically what we are doing when we design buildings uh, and you know, obtain um, LEED certification, we, are, we have the mindset of doing this harm. We are not, I mean, we're, we're using less energy, you know, uh, less damage on biodiversity, um, using less materials, less embodied carbon and all of that. So we will never end up with this mindset um, on the right side of this curve. We will always end, you know, on zero impact. What we really need is to create net positive buildings or, as I said, even regenerative uh, buildings. We, we, we need to do more good, not just do less harm, but we need to do more good. So we also need to agree that there are buildings that we will not do. And in Ramble, we have decided you know, that there are buildings we don't want to be part of because it is irresponsible. Uh, it is causing too much damage on the, damage on the planet. So uh, basically there is a red line here where we say we're not gonna go there. And that red line will move further and further towards the uh, right um, over the coming years so that we um, can stop doing the damage we're doing um, and what do we mean by regenerative design? Well, it is a holistic process-oriented approach of urban planning and design where the city is designed as a living system in partnership with nature. It requires a mind sh shift to an ecological worldview while combining strategies from regenerative design and approaches from the urban ecological design while studying local urban ecosystems and it aims for partnership with nature, a mutually beneficial, net positive and healthy relationship between humans and the natural world with a sufficient amount of energy and resources for both parties. So we, we're not just designing for humans. Obviously, we are designing for humans. Um, otherwise, we, we shouldn't build at all. Uh, but we are also having nature in mind. And just to show you some of the... Um, areas of work where we need to educate ourselves. This is you know, all of us. I don't believe there are many that um, are doing regenerative design today. We don't, we don't just need the usual, um, you know, buildings, technical um, competences. We need knowledge of nature. We need systematic health and well-being uh, knowledge, we need place-based thinking. So buildings are not the same, uh, you know, over uh, the same all over the world. They can be very different depending on where we build them. We need um, knowledge about co-evolution, about ecological worldview, and about whole systems approach. So there are a number of fields where uh, traditional designers, architects, engineers, and others are not very knowledgeable, not very strong, and we need that uh, to change. We need to uh, re-educate ourselves. Um, and to just 
you know, again, talk about uh, the traditional uh, sustainability concepts uh, work with conventional materials, fossil fuels, traditional design methods, uh, basic design ambition, <clears throat> uh, unsophisticated design briefs, single client centricity. So again, we are designing for humans and not uh, for other uh, so-called clients. So monospecies interests and, and we are all optimizers. We are trying to uh, optimize to minimize uh, the damage. This is where we come from. This is our thinking today when we design buildings. Uh, I think you can all recognize this. Um, what we need is to shift our mindset and jump on a, on a different curve, a different curve that has, uh, call it the regenerative design curve. It has new materials and composites, probably a lot of biogenic materials. It has renewable energy as its source of energy. We still need energy. We, we can't run a building without energy, uh, but it has to be renewable. Um, we need augmented design methods, uh, system-based development briefs, multiplicity of clients. So we're not just designing for one client, we are designing for future generations, for many different stakeholders and so on. We need planet and ecological based approach, uh, the multi-species interests and interests of the unborn, so future generations. And uh, some symbiotic relationships with other disciplines. So we have the sustainability uh, design curve and the regenerative design curve. Uh, you could also um, say we have the old sustainability thinking to the left, we have the new sustainability thinking to the right. So we are on a journey and, um, and I hope this is all of us, all of the construction industry, not only uh, us in Ramble. We are going from our, I mentioned in this case, DGNB, but this could be lead platinum as the, uh, as the baseline or the benchmark. Um, we are developing our design methods so we can hopefully achieve net zero uh, going forward. Um, later in the decade, uh, we are hoping to achieve net positives in all of our designs. And at the end of the decade, hopefully we have enough knowledge, training, skills, and we have brought the whole sector to be thinking in a regenerative uh, way. So that, is, that should be our ambition as an industry. And this should be an, our ambition um, in each of our uh, firms. So I want to just show you a couple of uh, projects that could be considered, uh, or at least they, they, they probably aren't, um, but they, they could be uh, showing some um, aspects of regenerative design. Um, so this is an office building that we are currently designing in uh, the center of Copenhagen. Uh, it's a 28,000 square meter building. It's um, made of timber and uh, it's uh, on a former industrial site. So you could say uh, when, when you start a project like that, how do you then what what is the ambition the ambition is that you you go to the site and you say we want to add more to the site than there was there before so we want to add more biodiversity we want to add more um, social uh, quality uh, we want to uh, add uh, an asset to the neighborhood we don't want to be a burden to the neighborhood. So on, on all parameters, we want this to have a positive impact rather than a, a negative impact, including on the environment, of course. Um, and so all of the features that I have written, I'm not gonna, gonna go through each of them, but all of these uh, features are uh, developed um, with that positive thinking in mind. How can we do more good rather than how can we do less harm. 
and and that's basically you know where we start when we design um, buildings how can we add more and how could we do more good um, the question is is this regenerative well it's um, it's hard to say we don't really have a, a definition or a rating system to define what exactly is regenerative design um, you could also view this as a, a traditional lead platinum building or maybe just a, a net zero building at the end of the day so um, big question mark still i think we can there's a lot that we can do more so we haven't done all and therefore i i think this is an attempt for regenerative uh, design but it's not um, where we will end up uh, in a decade from now another uh, project also in Copenhagen is um, a housing uh, community, a housing project, a neighborhood. Um, this is uh, close to the city center. Um, it's in, as you can see, it's a green space. So big question mark uh, is, is, is this taking away uh, some of the qualities of nature that we have there? Well. It is built on a former waste dump or a landfill. So you could say that uh, 20 years ago, this was not green space. 20 years ago, this was a very polluted site. And what we're trying to do now is uh, to uh, make use of, of a site uh, that once was um, very damaging on the environment and very damaging on the neighborhood as a whole. Um, again, we are talking about a timber project, um, a low rise um, with a lot of green. So biodiversity has been uh, a high priority in this project. Social uh, space, social interaction between people living here is very important. Uh, we see this as a contribution to the overall neighborhood. And so on all uh, parameters, this should also be uh, an attempt on a regenerative project. But is it really regenerative? Well, we haven't really um, defined uh, the, uh, the KPIs or the, the, the metrics for regenerative buildings. So it's, it's really hard to, to say. And I want to show you just um, a very famous uh, building again. Um, this is in the middle of Milan, uh, and this is nothing to do with us. We have not designed this, but it is uh, just showing um, maybe an extreme project. This is uh, built in a place where there was very little greenery, and then they you know, uh, planted trees on all the balconies. And over time, this has been, it's the vertical forest, uh, it's called. So it's it's almost like uh, you cannot cannot see the building anymore. You can only see the greenery. Um, uh, on this project, I want to say, well, it comes with a cost. You you do get more greenery, and hopefully you get uh, you know happy insects and happy birds. But you also use a lot of embodied carbon uh, to build a project like this because uh, it requires a lot of structural. Uh, concrete, a lot of uh, material to carry all this weight. Um, so again, question, is this regenerative? Well, we will have to uh, find out, we have to develop our thinking and our metrics. And, um, and one, one uh, tool that uh, we've been uh, part of uh, is the so-called material uh, pyramid. This uh, is the um, it's a tool where we, you know, in every project we go in and if you need a structural material or an insulation material or a facade material, you would go in and say, where, what is the lo lowest, you know, material in the pyramid uh, that we can, that is suitable for the use because uh, the lowest uh, materials are the ones with the least embodied carbon. 
and the highest uh, in is the, the one the most carbon intensive materials so basically the point is you should use less of the ones higher up in the pyramid and you should use more of the ones in the bottom so every time you are looking at a component the facade the structure whatever you should consider how low can I go? Where is the most suitable material with the lowest carbon emissions? And so a, a good tool, but we need more tools. We need tools um, for uh, you know considering biodiversity and all the other aspects that I mentioned earlier to um, to um, to design the regenerative buildings. So from from my point of view, uh, this is a call to action. Um, if we look at LEED, but it's the same for all certification schemes, we should develop a LEED concept um, to consider, you know, maybe a net zero impact LEED certification or a regenerative LEED certification. In that way, we can um, we have the metrics and we can we can certify a building as a net zero or a regenerative building rather than uh, now where we don't really have um, the metrics agreed uh, and the other things we need to do and i want to you know encourage all of you to get on um, this mission to to develop our mindset going from silo thinking to system thinking um, and as i said we need these certification schemes like LEED, uh, BREEAM, GGNB, and others, because building codes are not enough. Building codes rarely include any requirements apart from operational energy. So we cannot use building codes um, to, to push the development. Um, and finally, yeah, so, so that's why we need um, others to, to develop these metrics. So this was basically um, my uh, my pitch, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And of course, if if there are any uh, questions, I'd be happy to answer. Very welcome. If there are no questions, I'll just thank all of you for attending. I uh, hope you enjoyed it, and um, hope you um, will join me in the mission towards regenerative buildings. Thank you.